I think we'll have to start. Uh, my name is Danny Cohen, and uh, I'm pleased to moderate uh, this uh, session, which is dedicated to clinical aspects of uh, COVID-19. And uh, I would like to invite the first speaker, Professor Ori Al-Kayam, Al uh, from the uh, Tel Aviv Soraski Medical Center. And the lecture will be on COVID-19 in patients with autoimmune inflammatory rheumatic diseases prevalence and prevention. Well, uh, good morning. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, the COVID-19 research that we performed at the Tel Aviv Medical Center in patients with autoimmune inflammatory rheumatic diseases. And I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, Dr. Furer and Dr. Eviatar, who in fact led these studies, uh, which were performed at our Department of Rheumatology. And um, so when the pandemic started, it was very much concerned about how our patients with autoimmune inflammatory rheumatic disease may react to the virus. And uh, while well, I think, Dr. Uh, Professor Rav, that rheumatology is the most fascinating field in medicine, and it has been revolutionized by the introduction of many biologics and uh, uh, small molecules, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, and uh, uh, we have uh, which, and each of these drugs have, uh, have different mechanisms of actions, such as anti-TNF, anti-IL-6, anti-IL-17, B-cell depleting therapy, T-cell modulating therapy, and it is obvious that uh, uh, each of these drugs have a different uh, effect on the virus and on the vaccines. So the first question that we asked ourselves during the first wave was whether uh, our patients are more prone to develop uh, COVID-19. And uh, we performed an online survey uh, in more than 1,200 uh, patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And we found that, in fact, uh, the prevalence of COVID-19 during the first wave was comparable in patients with rheumatic disease uh, and the general population. And the major risk for infection was exposure to a known case of COVID-19. We then evaluated the seroprevalence of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in patients with autoimmune inflammatory disease, and we found that it was about 5%, and it was quite similar to what has been published at that time in the general population. And it was interesting to, uh, to, 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 uh, to observe that uh, the proportion of uh, the level was a little, a little lower in patients who were treated with immunosuppressive drugs. This may, of course, reflect uh, less exposures of the patients to a uh, to virus in general, or perhaps an effect of the uh, drugs on the, on the decline of the antibody levels. Uh, so from this study, we learned that, in fact, uh, it seemed that our patients are not more prone to develop uh, COVID-19. And this was further confirmed by other studies, uh, larger scale studies, uh, studies uh, for example, to mention one of them, one of them um, a patient um, study performed in South Korea, which included more than 133,000 uh, patients uh, who were tested for uh, COVID-19, and 6% of them uh, suffered from autoimmune inflammatory rheumatic diseases. And after matching, uh, the patient with uh, autoimmune inflammatory rheumatic disease showed an increased likelihood of testing positive for SARS-CoV-2 of uh, with an duration of 1.19, so a very mild increase uh, indeed. And then, uh, as we have heard uh, more than one year ago, uh, the first studies on the on vaccines, uh, on RNA vaccines in patients uh, in the general population uh, were published, and we had, in fact, to formulate some guidelines for uh, for patients with rheumatic diseases. And in fact, these guidelines were mainly based on what we knew uh, with other vaccines, influenza, uh, uh, pneumococcal vaccine, because we really, did, we really had no data on the, the efficacy and safety of RNA vaccines in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases, since the uh, Pfizer trial and Moderna trial did not include uh, these patients. So we decided to, uh, to plan a study uh, which was aimed to eval at evaluating the immunogenicity and safety of the Pfizer vaccine, and this has been published in the Annals of Rheumatic Diseases. Uh, the primary outcome was immunogenicity, and uh, the secondary outcomes were to, to evaluate the effect of immunosuppressive treatments on the immunogenicity, the vaccine efficacy, safety, and the effect of the vaccine on disease activity. And this was the prospective the multicenter study performed at the Tel Aviv uh, Suraski, Carmel, and Adassa Medical Center between December 20 and March 21. And uh, we included consecutive patients with rheumatic diseases, uh, mainly a rheumatoid arthritis patient, psoriasis arthritis, spondylar arthritis, lupus, vasculitis, and myositis. And we had a control group of a, a sample of the general population without a history of a rheumatic disease and without immunosuppressive uh, treatment. We did not include patients who had a previous history of COVID-19 inf infection. So this was a six-week open-label control 
a prospective phase four study where patients were screened and enrolled, they received the first dose of the vaccine, they were contacted by phone two weeks after uh, to evaluate the, the side effects, uh, after three weeks they received the second dose of the vaccine, and they were after two, two to four weeks after the second dose, they, they were evaluated for disease activity score, immunogen immunogenicity, efficacy, and adverse events. So uh, uh, we used the liaison uh, anti-trimeric S1, S2, spike glycoprotein antibodies to evaluate, to evaluate the immunogenicity, and the value above 15 binding antibodies was considered as a cutoff of seropositivity. Uh, we used the, the standardized technical scores that we use in, a, in a, the evaluation of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, cirrhotic arthritis, uh, spondylar arthritis, lupus, myositis, and vasculitis. And uh, we, uh, in terms of efficacy, at the post-vaccination visit, the participants were asked for the occurrence of the COVID-19 disease confirmed by PCR, and the patient's files were also reviewed. In terms of safety, as I said before, the patients were contacted after two weeks, and uh, they were also evaluated two to six weeks after the second vaccine dose, uh, uh, using a questionnaire on side effects, on local and systemic side effects, and other side effects. And so what were the results of this study? Uh, so we included a, in our study a 686 patients with rheumatic diseases and 120 healthy controls. You can see that most of the patients were well, there were a large proportion of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, axial spa, lupus, vasculitis. Uh, patients were older, uh, significantly older than the, than the controls. And, uh, uh, and uh, this table summarizes uh, the, the, the immunosuppression the drug that were used at that time. And you can see here that 20% uh, of the patients were on corticosteroids, 25 on methotrexate, 25 on TNF alpha, and, uh, and all. And so what were the, in fact, most of our patients developed a, a, a antibody response to the virus, 86% in comparison with 100% in controls. But you can see here that uh, the titer of antibody was lower in uh, the patients, uh, in the group of patients with rheumatic disease, 132 in comparison with 218 in the control group. But you can see here, for example, that for a disease such as a psoriatic arthritis and axial spa, or ax axial spa who are mainly treated with anti-TNF, and uh, uh, the seropositive rate was very good, and in fact, were very similar to the healthy con uh, controls. But uh, for diseases such as RA, and mainly for ankylosing vasculitis and, uh, and myositis, uh, the, sero the, the seropositive rate was low, around 30%. And as you will see later, this reflects the use of rituximab in these diseases. So uh, we performed an adjusted and adjusted logistic regression models to examine the association between patient's characteristics and seropositivity. And we found, uh, as expected, that age above 65 and also a diagnosis of RA, myositis, ankylosing vasculitis were associated with a lower rate of uh, seropositivity. And when we evaluated the effect of immunosuppressant and immunogenicity, we found that the main factor that affected the immunogenicity was the use of CD20 depleting therapy, rituximab. You can see here that only 40% of these patients developed uh, antibodies to the virus, but also uh, the use of corticosteroids, uh, abatacept, which is a drug that uh, interferes between the stimulation of uh, dendritic cell and uh, T cells, and also MMF, which also influences the T cell function. These drugs were associated with a lower rate of, a, of a seropositivity, although it was better than for rituximab. Um, so rituximab is, is a targeted uh, B-cell therapy, which is, it is, it is a human, uh, it's a chimeric uh, human monoclonal antibodies that uh, uh, um, targets the CD20 uh, receptor, and uh, it induces, in fact, it is administered with we, we administered two infusions of, uh, of rituximab two weeks uh, apart. And after the first infusion, there is a, a severe uh, B cell depletion, which lasts at least six months. So patients receive uh, their treatment between six to one year, six months to 12 months uh, after the first uh, uh, course of uh, rituximab. So we found that. Um, we had a quite, quite a large population of patients on rituximab. In fact, we further enlarged this population to more than 100 patients uh, on rituximab who received the vaccine. And we could show very nicely that the time interval between rituximab administration and vaccination predicted a serological response. For example, patients who uh, 
uh, had received the vaccine within six months after rituximab had a response rate to date of less than 20%, while after one year it was it raised to a 50%. And we could also show that the, the immunogenic response was related to the number of rituximab courses before vaccination, the level of IgG, and as I said before, the interval. Uh, and based on these uh, uh, parameters, we, we developed a calculator which uh, could predict the probability of developing antibodies according to uh, these uh, parameters that I mentioned before. So uh, we found that, as I said before, that uh, glucocorticosteroid, MMF, and abatacept also decrease immunogenicity. Methotrexate, which uh, is known to decrease immunogenicity to influenza, for, ex for example, was shown to, to, uh, to decrease also immunogenicity, but to a lesser extent than the above treatment. But the good news are that uh, more than 97% of the patients were, were on anti-cytokine therapies, anti-TNF, INTL17, anti-L6, had an appropriate immunogenic response when used as monotherapy. In terms of safety, the prevalence of mild adverse events was similar uh, in patients and control. Uh, uh, there were no serious or major adverse events in the control group, but we had some adverse events of special interest in our patients. We had two patients who developed uveitis, one patient uh, pericarditis, and we had six patients who developed herpes zoster. And uh, uh, later on, uh, this uh, observation was confirmed by other studies, not only in patients with rheumatic diseases, but in general, it seems that there is some link between the occurrence of herpes zoster after a uh, vaccination. We had three patients who died. One of them was a patient uh, who uh, was a, a post-renal transplantation. He didn't develop antibodies to the virus and he contracted the COVID-19 and died. We had one patient who had an MI and another one, another patient with vasculitis who developed a very severe uh, fulminant vasculitic uh, disease. We are not sure that it is related to the, to the, to the vaccine, but these are the facts. In terms of the, the effect of the vaccines on disease activity, it didn't affect the disease activity in general. Most of the scores remained stable in all the diseases that we uh, evaluated. So this was the, the first uh, large multicenter real life study conducted in COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and in fact, it, most of the patients responded to the, to the vaccines. Uh, we found that some drugs uh, may affect the immunogenicity. And uh, of course, one of the limitations of the study was that uh, the control population and the, uh, the control population were not matched. And uh, we did not have any pre-vaccination COVID-19 antibody levels. So we, uh, although uh, our prime minister uh, declared after the mass vaccination campaign that we overcome the pandemics, we all know that we have many, many ways. We had many, many ways after that. And we have the opportunity to continue uh, evaluating the immunogenicity in our patients. So uh, after six months, about uh, 628 patients came back uh, to evaluate the, the level of antibodies. And we also evaluated the, the immunogenicity after the third, uh, do the, booster, the third booster of the vaccine. And you can see here that uh, as it, it has been shown in, in, in uh, the LC population, there was a decline in the level of, uh, of antibodies uh, in patients and the uh, and in, uh, in controls, and the degree of the, of, of the decrease was quite similar, but since our patients started from a lower level of antibodies, there were higher level of, ser of seronegativity after six months, but the good news are that the booster increased, restored the immunogenic response. You can see here a very nice response in both groups, in the controls and uh, the patients with rheumatic disease, and this is shown in the graph. Uh, and the question is uh, whether patients who didn't respond well uh, to, the, to, uh, uh, to the first dose of the vaccine uh, responded uh, 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 to the third dose, for example, patients with, who were treated with abatacept or MMF, and indeed they had a very nice response after the third dose of the vaccine, but in patients with rituximab, uh, only a third of them responded to the third dose of the vaccine. So uh, it remains uh, um, uh, an issue uh, in, in this population of patients. In terms of efficacy, we had only a small number of patients who developed uh, COVID-19. It was before the Omicron. In general, it seemed that there was a correlation between the titer of antibodies to the vaccine and the, and the, and the disease, but we cannot achieve any conclusion from these small numbers of, of patients. So the key messages of these uh, studies are that uh, most uh, patients with uh, rheumatic disease treated with different disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, drugs have an adequate response to COVID-19 vaccine. Most DMARTs, including methotrexate, anti-cytokine biologics, and also JAK inhibitors can be continued without, with relation to the administration of the vaccine. 
uh, we have to consider uh, the, the timing of vaccination with respect to rituximab. Perhaps we have to postpone treatment with rituximab or to postpone the vaccine. Uh, the, the, it's not very clear. And uh, we have shown that six months after vaccination, there is a decline in the antibody uh, response, but uh, the third response, the third dose uh, restores the immune response in most patients. So I would like to thank all the study participants, all the study collaborators, and as I said before, Vika, Tali, and the study coordinators. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kayam. Uh, if there, there are uh, questions. Questions, please. What do you mean by viral titer? I don't understand. So you, the data of antibodies, you mean? Yes? Oh, no. no, we didn't. No, I don't not see. No. Any other questions? I, I have a comment, uh, actually. It's, it's very similar, the results and the dynamics of, uh, of antibodies, both in... Uh, in uh, quantitatively uh, and qualitatively, very similar to what's happening in, in Crohn and uh, in IBD patients, uh, uh, those uh, receiving or getting the anti-TNF. So uh, a very uh, a rapid decay after third dose, but then there is a booster. The booster uh, brings back uh, uh, the titles at uh, high levels. But all the time, there is a, there is a kind of a gap yes. between the... the uh, uh, the magnitude of the response. Okay, uh, if there is no any more questions, so thank you very much. Uh, so, so